Welcome back to Right Into Your High Calling with Sherry McGriff. Today I have a treat for you. I have author Philip Wilder. Say hi, Philip. Hey guys, it's great to be here. And uh, he is many things, guys. He is the adventure nut, I would say, but how to find adventures in Christ and like real life adventures. And I can't wait for you to get get to know him a little bit, but first we're going to pray. So I'm going to pray first, Philip, and then if you want to add anything, please do. Okay. 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 So father, we just looked up this podcast and we just ask that you guide our conversation and that everyone listening or watching will get at least one nugget to go away with today, Lord, um, for their writing and for their life and their family in Jesus name. Yeah. And father, I just pray that you would speak through us, give us your words and direct this conversation as you so desire to encourage those who are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so Philip um, is, well, he says he was at your average 26-year-old. Um, now you're probably 27, right? I am actually 28. 28. So. Okay. <laughs> um, Arabic speaking, in English, obviously, and world traveling guy. He started at the age of 13. He had a passion for evangelism and writing fiction um, from sharing the gospel with his soccer teammates, co-workers, classmates to fellow um, patrons. He simply just couldn't stop sharing or writing. Um, shortly after graduating from the University of Colorado in Denver, God whisked him off on a grand adventure to the Middle East to be a missionary there for two years. And while there, his passion for writing fiction novels grew along with his heart for the unreached people uh, groups around the world, which is fantastic. Uh, Philip came on staff with the Great Commission Alliance. We want you to talk a little bit about that um, and join forces with them. Now he writes fiction and nonfiction to inspire believers to follow God into the adventure he planned um, by taking wild steps of faith. And he hopes that as more believers follow God to reach the lost in their hometown, more will go to reach unreached people groups around the world that have never heard the gospel before. So you can learn more about Philip and his story at Philip with one L, philipwilder.com, one L, where he posts weekly blogs and podcasts centered around challenging believers to adventures in Christ-filled lives and wild steps of faith. You know, one thing I noticed about you, Philip, on Instagram, I follow you on Instagram, is you do these devotionals. Now, the last one I heard, you were like 280 something. Was that for the year or from the very beginning? I'm at 257 right now. Oh. Uh, just that was updated as of today. And I started sometime at the beginning of last year. So I almost do them daily. Almost. There's a few days that I miss, but yeah. And that was just from the, a year ago or yeah, um, that's me. So are you restarting with this year or are you just going to keep going? I'm just going to keep going and we'll see how high that number can get. I mean, I see no reason to stop. I love encouraging people. And even if just one person listens through and is encouraged, so be it. But yeah, Absolutely. one of the greatest things my mom ever taught me, which I know that makes me sound so cool. Uh, one of the greatest things my mom ever taught me is just to read the Bible every day. And that's stuck with me. And honestly, I think if I can attribute anything that God does through me, it's simply to that one thing my mom taught me. So yeah, if I'm going to read daily, I might as well share daily. Well, that's true. That's true. And actually what I noticed about you is you are really good at social media. So Thank since you. we're talking about your, um, your video blog on Instagram and, um, you have a great website. So if you need an example of a great website for authors, definitely go look at his. And then, um, you're just really good at your social media. Do you plan what you're going to do? We're gonna talk about your books in a second, but do you plan what you're going to post? Do you have like a content planner or you just go with your daily devotions and you post what God's telling you that day? I really don't feel like I deserve that, but thank you. I'm glad that that's what you see. Uh, I don't, I don't really have a formula. I mean, I read my Bible every day and I post that on my story every day. Other than that, it's just kind of like 
here's this really fun adventure that God took me on. I'd love to share that with people. Oh, here's this really cool thing that God taught me in his word. I'm going to share that with people or uh, sharing blog posts. Uh, I've got my drone this last year and I've been sharing drone videos. And so uh, just, I love capturing just the wildness of God's creation. I know I say wild all the time, but I, God is wild and it's just such a fascinating element of who he is. No, he is wild. I mean, he's wild. He's crazy. He's fun. He's just, he's righteous. Mm -hmm. He's all loving. You know, that's one thing I forgot to mention what I, when I was looking at your books, uh, well, the one book I'll mention here in just a second, what I feel like part of your message is you're trying to tell people God is good. He is absolutely good. And I, I kind of see this theme through your posts and your book. So let's talk about your books though. Let me tell you. Okay, so Philip has three books. The one I have is Discovering God's Calling. And this is nonfiction. And then let me make sure I get the titles right of the other two. Then you have a dystopian sci-fi called Winter. Now, is that one out yet? I'm trying to get that one traditionally published. So it, it it's okay. done. It's ready. I have edited that thing. Who knows how many times, but still waiting for a traditional publisher. It's currently under review to be published. So okay. you can be praying for that. But yeah. So do you have an agent? Did you go through the process and try to get an agent first or what did you do? I have tried every single process there is. And you know, God will open the door when the time is right. And so far, that has been a no, but who knows with this new publisher, maybe that'll work out. But no, I do not have an agent for any of my books so far. And, and but you also don't need one. Um, no. You know, you don't need permission. So everybody out there, you do not need permission other than God's permission to publish because we're in a new time. Time is short and we need to get out what the messages he's put on us. We need to get those out and just... Writing a book can take several years, depending on, you know, what, what you're writing. And then the publishing, once you get picked up, can also take another two years to get it out. So it really does depend on, you know, the book and what God's saying and the process he has for that particular message. And then your other book, which I'm really interested in, is a fantasy novel called Rifter. Tell us about that one. Is it finished or is it still in progress? <laughs> Finished is an interesting term. Uh, <laughs> it, it was finished five years ago and is about to be finished again. <laughs> okay. I'm going through another round of editing and changing things up a little bit, which will be pretty cool if it hits it off and people want to see the old version of Rifter. It would be cool to share that as well, too, because both versions are awesome. I think there's just a kind of big, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but there's a big change in it and uh, I think it makes it better. So I'm excited to see um, what publishers think with the revamped version, but yeah, so it, it was finished five years ago. It'll be finished again, hopefully by the end of this month. And then we'll see, I kind of, for the longest time, I felt like God was calling me to traditionally publish. And just recently God's asked me to kind of reevaluate that decision. So I might self-publish it. I might hold on to traditionally publishing goals. We'll see, but it's it's all in God's hands. <laughs> uh, yeah, it it really is. Um, so tell me about that one though, because I write fantasy too. So oh, yes. and you mentioned, I don't want to read it. I want you to tell me. You mentioned two realms, mm -hmm. and like my um, my own imprint is two realms press. So I'm like, oh. You got me at two realms. So tell me uh, a little bit about it. Yeah. The, maybe some agent out there. Or something. <laughs> yes. If you're agent, then really be listening you or need publisher. A fantasy novel. Yeah. No, uh, God will open the right doors when the time is right. But the principal idea behind that one is what would it look like if someone had the ability to jump between the human and spiritual realms? What would that look like? And how, how would that change their mind? How would that just change the way they see life? And so that's kind of the goal behind it. And honestly, I just really love that book because the whole book is an adventure, like just constant movement. Like it's, I'm really enjoying going back through and editing it because a lot of my other books 
can be really deep and plot heavy, which is great. I, I love that. But this one, the plot is definitely heavy, but through and through, it's just a lot of movement, a lot of action, and just a lot of mystery, which is really fun. And going back through it, I'm just surprised that my past younger self could be so clever to come up with something like that. But of course, it's always God. So praise God for it. Yeah. Um, you know, he created the world with words and he put that imagination in us. And so it comes through the writer and I'm really looking forward to that. And, you know, we live in two realms. We live in the spirit and the natural. Um, we don't always realize that we can live in both of those realms and not everyone can see in the spirit, although you can, um, you can practice. God can teach you how. So if you're interested in that. So anyway, I'm looking forward to that book. I really do want to read that book. Yeah. I, well, hopefully I really it'll do. be available soon, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's a fun read and I definitely stole some, some flair from Tangled by creating a, I call it an outrageously smart horse. And it's just fun to see the characters interact. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love that. Uh, that one was a cute movie. So let's talk about this one, Discovering God's Calling. Now, this is your latest book, although you have another book in progress right now. What's that called? Well, man, I have so many books in progress right now. Oh, you now. do? Okay. Yeah. Um, it just the sing- depends. <laughs> the singleness one you mentioned to me. Yeah. So I'm working on a book with C.E. White on uh, basically singleness. Yeah. How to enjoy singleness how to have a new vision for singleness and i think it's something that really whether you're single or not it's a great book because we all have preconceived notions of singleness we all have this idea of like singleness is a trap to be escaped in a sense or um marriage is the ideal and if someone isn't married then like i've heard many people say to me while i was single now i'm married which um, it's kind of an interesting part with that book, but a lot of people told me while I was single, like, oh, you're single. Well, I'll be praying for you. And it's like, so you're assuming that singleness isn't God's will for me. Is that what you're saying? Like singleness, marriage is no better than singleness and living a life single. Sure. Follow God's calling and God's will. And in that regard, marriage can be better or singleness can be better. But after getting married, I realized all these like all these really big and high dreams and goals I had and thought that marriage would be thinking that, oh, once I get married, it'll be like a movie and I'll be happy all the time. And like every single time my wife and I hold hands, it'll just be like butterflies in my stomach because I didn't have my wife was my first girlfriend and I met her right before I turned 25. So I had many years of singleness and the girls saying no to me over and over and over and that was just there's a lot of lies in that season that I believed there was a lot of false hopes that I believed about marriage and about dating and so yeah honestly I wrote that book or am writing um it's mostly done but we're writing that book to just hopefully encourage people and help them to just be grateful for where they are because there's many things about singleness that are real blessing in life. So one is not better than the other, though our society loves to make singles think that they're seriously missing out on life and that they can't have a rich and rewarding life without getting married. Of course, if your goals and dreams in life are to live out the American dream, then you're absolutely right. You are missing out on life because you can't have the American dream as a single. But if you're following God, it doesn't matter whether you're married or not. I mean, it matters on whether or not God's calling you into it, but you can have a rich and rewarding life spiritually and an awesome adventure as a single person. So that's what that one's about. Absolutely. I hope everyone out there that is single, just listen to that. You might need to rewind, and listen to that again. Enjoy where you where God has you. Enjoy it. You know, um, yes. You want to make sure you marry the person God has for you. Otherwise, you'll be sorry you got married, you know? Exactly. And, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So let's talk about this one, Discovering God's Calling. Tell me about this book. Yeah. So Discovering God's Calling is not the book I expected to write, but the book that 
my life story kind of wrote in a sense. Um, I mean, all my books kind of come out of my life in one way or another, but this book, I kind of realized that I was uniquely qualified to write that book because ultimately what it comes down to is everyone tries to make decisions that they think would be best for their life. And oftentimes it's like, oh, here's this passion and dream that I have. So I'm going to pursue this. And many times we don't trust God with those passions and desires. Now, not every passion and desire will God fulfill. There are many passions and desires that are sinful that God definitely won't fulfill. But I think it's kind of, I mean, for me, whenever I distrusted God with my dreams and with my passions, it was kind of foolish. I now look, I now recognize looking back, not to say that I was foolish or that people who are doing that are foolish, but if God gave you a passion and a desire, there's a reason for that. And the wonderful thing about the Christian calling is that it's not like another religion where the goal of the religion is to get to eternity. You know, you look at Islam, you look at Hinduism, Buddhism, all the other religions are all about getting to heaven. That is the goal of the religion. Be a good whatever so that you can get to that afterlife. Whereas with Christianity, it's like God says, look, you're promised it once you ask Jesus to save you from your sins. Like, boom, now you have eternity. So then what, what's the purpose of Christianity? What's the purpose of living? You know, if you're already promised this thing, and the purpose, of course, is to be in a relationship with God, but then additionally, to join God in reaching out to the lost and helping more people come to find this true life that we found. And so I just... I myself got caught up in all these video games and not that video games are wrong. Like I'll play video games now and then, but I know that there are so many guys out there who just love video games and you got to ask yourself, why do guys love video games so much? And yes, girls like video games too. I'm not going <laughs> to isolate that, but I believe people love video games because they want adventure. And because they've believed the lie that this world has no more adventure out there for them. It's all discovered. There's no noble battles to fight. You know, there's no invading aliens or zombies to fight. So the only adventure out there is digital and online and fictional. But I mean, if God's wired within us that desire for adventure, why would he not provide an outlet for that in the real world and in what he's called us to do? So reading books like God Smuggler, if you're listening and you haven't read or listened to God Smuggler, it is a fantastic book written by Brother Andrew and so many other books like that too. I mean, you can read any missionary book like George Mueller, Hudson Taylor, William Carey, um, Mary Slessor. There's so many. There, there's another great one by Bruce Olson called Bruchko, which that's a wonderful book. But all of them just go to emphasize that there is an incredible adventure out there for anyone who is willing to take that step of faith and trust God. And God is the best at orchestrating adventures. I mean, all these other adventures that the world promotes to us are short and temporary and kind of shallow in a sense. You know, the like, think about going in uh, whitewater rafting the Grand Canyon. You know, that that's like, for some people, the epitome of adventure right there or scaling Mount Everest, you know, all these awesome adventures. Once you finish it, you come back and what is it? Just like a cool memory and a badge to say, I did this thing. Whereas like, if you like are like brother Andrew smuggling Bibles behind the iron curtain, you know, you're sure there's a badge of like, yeah, I smuggled Bibles into a country where it's illegal to have Bibles. But additionally, it's like, and I got to see people trust in Christ and be saved for an eternity. Like I got to play a part of God's grand rescue plan. That's what gets me fired up. I mean, that is an adventure that's thrilling and exciting in the moment. Awesome. Like an amazing memory but also just has eternal implications whereas climbing mount everest you know unless if you share the gospel with your sherpa <laughs> you're not really seeing any eternal difference so uh, that's kind of what led to this book and 
what gets me so excited about it because I love seeing young guys recognize that they don't have to enter into the digital world to have an adventure. They don't have to go and live recklessly driving 90 miles an hour on a motorcycle down the highway to have an adventure. Adventure is in following God and taking wild steps of faith. Like it's an adventure in your backyard. It's an adventure even in your own house. It's an adventure outside. It's an adventure everywhere and you have no idea what God is going to do. No, you definitely don't. Now the cover though, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, so I don't Coming know. off of a mountain. So you can do both, both adventures. God yeah. will give you both adventures. Yeah. You should actually turn that book sideways because that's more so what was actually happening there. Oh, wrong way. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what's actually know. going on there. I'm not hanging off the side of a mountain, <laughs> but yes. And that's the cool thing because, you know, I thought too, if you follow Jesus, it just means you're going to have a boring life. You're just going to, yeah, you're going to be sharing the gospel with people around you, which by the way, is exhilarating. <laughs> I mean, it puts you outside your comfort zone. It gets your heart pounding. It is just a really cool adventure right there. But also God knows the adventure in your heart. Like he knows how to bring you on crazy adventures. And we could talk more about those adventures later, but like I've been to, I think I just reached 30 countries now and I got my passport when I turned 20, 22. So in the last six years, I've been to 30 countries, which I had no idea that's what would happen. And of course, it doesn't mean that the only adventure isn't traveling. No. There are so many adventures all around. And some of the greatest adventures I've had is just right in my backyard. Like, well, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but <laughs> there's a lot of, God could do anything. He's not limited to sending you to a different country. Well, even writing is an adventure, mm, especially yeah. the fiction. Well, I mean, nonfiction too, but when you're writing fiction, you start writing things that you didn't know you were going to write and you're like living mm -hmm. this adventure until, you know, some, some noise interrupts you and takes you out of the story, you know? So that's exciting too. Speaking of, um, so let me talk about the structure because you mentioned it leading people to Christ. So your book, I don't remember, um, you, you have a lot of chapters and they're, they're like devotions, like your videos that you do on Instagram, but then the end of each one leads you. So the little box with arrows leads you to the back of the book to do an action step, which I think is really important if you do some type of devotional. So, so your choice was not to have the, devo um, the action steps at the end of a chapter, but at the end of the book, which I think is, is brilliant too. Uh, I just want to show you. So the very first one strategies for leading people to Christ. I don't know if you can actually see it on the screen, but then, um, you know, there's different ones at the end of each. So, you know, it can be used in many, many ways. Um, I just thought that was really good. What, why did you make that choice to put the, the action part at the end by the, uh, at the end of each chapter? Why did you make that choice? Because it's definitely a, a choice. Right. Yeah. So I didn't want discovering God's calling to be a devotional. Okay. <laughs> the reason why is because, I mean, I'm sure you're really inspired and challenged by this book and people all across the board are, but I really wanted to reach young guys. And if someone comes up to them and says, Hey, you should check out this devotional. They're how many of those be. guys would just put it down and ignore it? Of course, so much of it builds off of what the Bible's saying. And I did want to encourage people to go back to the Bible. And so I wanted that devotional element to be there, but I wanted it ultimately to be a book that you could just read through. And then if you wanted to get more out of it, you could flip to the back of the book for each chapter and kind of pull a devotional out of it. Plus that's great for Bible studies or small groups, whatever. But I mean, the main action steps I did include right in the middle of the book, as far as figuring out the things that you're really passionate about and how to grow deeper in those things and really recognize what makes your heart sing and how can you use that to make God's name known? Yeah, see, there you go. So the important action steps that I really wanted to have be in the midst of the body of the book, those are in there. 
And I mean, well, it's all important. I'm not going to say one part's less important, but I wanted it to be a book read with like a devotional element at the back if you wanted to get that out of it. No, I think that's perfect because you have to know your audience. So if you know who you're writing to, then you'll, it can affect the structure of the book, which I haven't um, seen a lot of when it comes to men, because primarily I know uh, female authors, right? So no, I thought that was fantastic. I actually think that I will buy my son this and I have two sons-in-laws, so I will buy this for them too as well, you know? So um, I'm planning to do that. I thought Thank that you. was just, I thought it was really good. I, I like that you also have photographs in here, but you know, it's definitely the format, the structure, the, um, the way you've set it all up. It, 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 it speaks to a guy. It speaks to a guy, it speaks to a young guy. And then it does look like you're repelling off a cliff. So it definitely <laughs> would draw the attention of a younger guy um, or a guy who likes sports. Or, or hiking and things like that. And that'll, you know, the cover is what grabs somebody and makes them decide if they will want to uh, buy it or not. But then the devotional aspect, let's say you have a youth group, um, a young guy, a young a college group, even um, you could use it, you know, in a small group or something. So yeah. out there, I mean, I think it would be great. So tell me um, what, is your typical writing process. So you have a lot of different types of books. Do you, what's your typical writing process? Hmm. That's, <laughs> that's a good question. You know, in many ways, I don't like to limit myself. And I also like to challenge myself. And so because of that, I see my writing process changing a lot. Um, for example, that winter book, that's the first of a four book series. And I'd heard from somewhere that how um, JK Rowling like plotted out her books was she had like the main plot elements and she included each of those core plot elements into each book. And I was like, well, that's, that's pretty cool. I'd like to do that. And so I incorporated an element of that. I'm like, okay, each main plot element is going to be a part of each book that way it's like a continual growth on all these different plot elements um the book that i'm writing right now which is based fundamentally on the idea of if like <laughs> if you're stranded on a different planet by yourself is the bible still right when it says do not fear and how can the Bible say, do not fear, when you're millions of miles away from the next person? And so, like, that was my idea with it. And I just wanted to adventure with the main character. So I haven't been plotting that one out too much. I, as I've been going along, I've started, like, seeing certain things like, okay, I'd like to incorporate this. I'd like to add that. Um, maybe this is how it will end, but ultimately I just want to explore this new world with the character and, oh, let's throw this thing in there. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. What does that mean for this thing? And so, yeah, each time it tends to be different. I think for me, the one thing that's been pretty consistent is I will outline to some degree what's happening so for both with <laughs> wifter rifter and winter i outlined each chapter and i stuck pretty closely to that but i definitely changed things up as i felt like i needed to go but each chapter i gave about a paragraph of what i wanted to see in it and then i would just go from there because if i outlined it too much then i eliminated all the creativity on the front end and then the rest of the book was just I felt like robotic filling in the gaps <laughs> and I didn't like that. So for the most part, I'll outline to some degree, like a little bit of each chapter, and then I'll go through filling in all the extra details. Like I'll change the setting. I'll change. Sometimes I won't even include a setting. I'll just have like one quote that I want to have be said in that chapter. And I'll be like, okay, what would be the coolest way to say that one quote? Um, or this one paradigming shift uh, plot point, 
how do I want to have that be revealed? Oh, well, that would be really cool. Let's throw them on the edge of a cliff or <laughs> whatever. So I guess that's the most consistent way that I've gone through it. But I think beyond that, it's just finish the book. Don't, don't like for me, <laughs> yeah. like don't get hung up in the editing. Don't make it so that those first few chapters are perfect before you finish it because you don't know where the book wants to go. I mean, you know where you want it to go, but you don't know where the book wants to go until you finish it. And so you really can't finalize those first chapters until you finish the book. And if you focus too much on those first chapters, then it's going to be really hard for you to let those first chapters go when you do finish the book and realize, well, those first chapters need to change in order to incorporate or start foreshadowing this big plot change or this big uh, new revelation. So yeah, it, it kind of changes for each one. And I think ultimately you need to just trust God and how he leads you to do it. Like there are times where I'll be trying to outline and it is just not working. And I'll pray and ask God, like, God, what do you want me to do? And he's like, right, just start writing and trust me. <laughs> or there's times where I'm writing and I don't want to outline, but then God just doesn't let anything flow out. And so I'll stop and be like, okay, let's write some character backstory here and figure out who this character is a little bit more. So this won't be a part of the story, but at least then I'll know. And that'll help me go forward after that. So follow God. Don't think that one person's way is how you need to do it. Um, <laughs> there's a phrase, there's more than one way to skin a cat, which is a little morbid, but I'm a dog person. So I guess I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Skin a cat. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I, let me just add to what you said about uh, writing the beginning of the book. You don't want to go back and edit while you're writing because it'll paralyze. It can paralyze you. It can really paralyze you and keep you from going forward. So yes, finish the book and then go back and um, revise. Unless you're just revising. Uh, I think was it Hemingway or someone? You would go back and revise a little bit and then right forward. So other than that, you just finish the book and then you can always go and fix anything. So that's really good. Well, those were a lot of great tips, but um, do you have any other tips for maybe beginning writers or writers that feel stuck? I mean, my the thing I would share with every single writer is don't just write for fun. Use that passion for writing, but make a difference. <laughs> there are so many words being put out there. And I mean, ultimately follow God. I can't say you need to talk about missions work with all of your books. You have to talk about sharing the gospel with all of your books. No, follow God, like truly and genuinely step before God and ask him what he's calling you to write because the world needs that. The world doesn't need more books thrown out there just because you want to make money or just because it was fun. There are so many books like that and God knows what will be fun. He, he knows exactly what will make your heart sing. He knows exactly what will heal you as you go along. I was listening to your last podcast episode where you guys talked about healing and do you need to be health? Do you need to write from a place of being healthy? And, you know, I think God wants to help us all to be more healthy through our writing as well, too. I mean, yes, we should always try to be healthy when we step before our computers and start writing, but you know, I've experienced a tremendous amount of growth simply through writing and recognizing, oh my gosh, I am this character and he is a jerk. I need a change. So uh, <laughs> it, you just need to follow God with that and he will bring the writing where it needs to be. But, you know, this, I've had a struggle a lot of times with writing in a sense, because for me, writing could be just like video games in that you're just pulling yourself into another world and you can use you can use books and writing just to escape where you're at mm -hmm. and that's not to say writing or reading or even video games are bad but if you're using it to escape or if that's what you're excited about every single day and you're longing towards the next time you can like step back into it which okay i understand how like captivating books can be and video games can be like i understand that but if you're living for books or video games like I don't want to ever encourage someone into that. And so by writing, am I doing exactly that? And I've had to weigh this balance of, 
No, I am writing to help people see the world from God's perspective. Because as a writer, like writing is so powerful. You're basically watching a movie, you know, you can, it like producers have to direct the viewer's eye to certain things, you know, and oftentimes we miss important things in movies or we can't hear certain things in movies. Whereas when it comes to reading, you're literally telling your reader what to think as far as how to view things, how to think about things, how certain people are saying things, how they're reacting to things. You're literally, it, in some ways, it feels as if you're reprogramming your reader, like how they should be thinking about something. So for me, if I'm going to hold that sort of power for a reader, I want to make sure that I am pointing them right back to God, pointing them right back to how they should be viewing life. So that by the time that they step away from reading that book, they're like, wow, that was a good story. But was that really a story or is that real life? <laughs> you know, how awesome it, would it be if somebody could finish reading a story and recognize like, yes, that story was fiction, but I could live that life right now. What's keeping me from living that life in my own life and incorporating that into mine? Like, I want that adventure in my life. So my hope for every single writer is that they would utilize what God's given them to build God's kingdom, not our own kingdoms, not our own names, but to point people towards God and his kingdom and what he's doing in this world, because he's doing some great things. And yeah, it's fun to join him in it. Absolutely. And, um, and because we do hold such power, you know, uh, you know, I say in my podcast all the time, God created the world with words, Mm -hmm. words, and then the writer, the communicator, we create the world, whether it's through a story in a book or in a movie or a play or just a blog post or whatever, a Facebook post, we're creating that world too. And our words have power. And so that is why it's essential that we live in holiness. That is why it's essential that we are close to the Lord. And especially in the days and times we're in now, you need to get even closer than you ever have before so that you are filled up to go out and win the lost and give them hope. But it's so important that, you know, we're repenting and not living in shame. I mean, we ask him to forgive us. He forgives us. We let him heal us. And then we're riding from that place of healing so that we're not transferring bad stuff. We're only transferring the good. You know, it's just so important. It's so important. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, do you have a small section uh, that you would like to read to us? Uh, yeah, Great. I do have it. I suppose it's it's just the introduction to discovering God's calling. Go for it. But I feel like it. I just really love it. I don't know what else to say about it. It just I, I really it speaks to my heart. And yeah. I hope for all of you listening, it'll speak to your hearts. And maybe um, after reading it, you'll be able to decide whether or not this book is for you or for someone else that you know. But the introduction reads, since the beginning of time, God has had a plan for people. He desired to live with us in a close relationship where we could express ourselves freely and enjoy who he created us to be. Then sin entered the equation and brought confusion and death into the world. The war between good and evil began. Like a massive plane with a broken wing, humanity and all of creation started plummeting towards destruction. When Jesus came, died, and rose again to conquer sin and death, he set mankind on a new trajectory. He made an escape for people. Only by believing in Jesus and asking him to save us from our sins can we escape this inevitable fate. But escaping it isn't God's only hope for us. He's called us to take part in rescuing our family, friends, neighbors, and everyone else from this coming destruction before it's too late. To do so, God's given each of us a specific set of skills and a unique plan. This is your calling. This is your destiny. Will you join him in this grand mission? Will you join me and billions of others throughout time and history in the greatest war human history has ever known? And that, yeah, that just speaks to me so much because like that, that is the adventure. That's the war that we get to fight. And it's oftentimes people are afraid of evangelism. 
and discipleship as well too. And, you know, I can understand it's a scary thing and we have an enemy who would love to stop us in that. But realistically, evangelism and discipleship, the fact that we can join God in this mission should be the greatest honor we could ever experience. I mean, the creator of the universe is asking us, come with me, (laughs) join me in saving lives. And I hope to all of you listening that this would just be such a huge encouragement to you, knowing that you can make a difference. God has gifted you with unique qualities to make a unique difference. Your testimony even just is its own key, a key that no one else has, and potentially the only key that will unlock somebody's heart and let them, will help them let Jesus in. And that is, that is a power and a gift that we should not set aside and forget about. It's something that we need to be utilizing and thanking God that we have it in the first place and that he's asking to use it. And so that's my hope for everyone that uh, all of you listening would be able to join God in that great mission because it is, it is worth it. It is so worth it. We have an eternity to pursue fun to pursue exploration, to go on like serious adventures and exploring the world or galaxy, whatever eternity holds. We have an eternity to do that, but we only have this lifetime to reach the lost. And I don't want to miss that opportunity. Absolutely. I don't either. I think you should, um, lead people to Christ right now. You never know who's listening. That's true. You may, you might've grown up in the church and you believe you're a Christian, but you really don't know this Jesus. You really don't know him. And that's the case of probably millions of Christians around the world. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Pray with us. So uh, you pray and I'll pray after you. And so if you're out there, rededicate your life, or dedicate your life to the Lord for the first time. And then um, make sure you contact us and let us know that you did that. Okay. Yeah. And I guess I just want to explain real quick before we do pray that for all of you listening and you just really do feel your heart stirring, whether you truly are a Christian or not. I mean, if you truly are a Christian and you feel your heart stirring, maybe this is the moment to rededicate yourself to God. If you're not a believer and you don't fully understand God in his way, that, that is okay. If you have more questions, that is totally fine. I have more questions. (laughs) I do not understand everything yet. And I keep searching out those questions and God is helping me through it. And he'll continue to help you. You do not have to understand everything. What Jesus asks us to do is admit that we're sinners, that we cannot get to heaven by doing enough good. Thank goodness we don't have to get to heaven by doing enough good because I hate tests (laughs) And I could not imagine how stressful life would be if all of life was a big test where you had no idea how you were doing and you never got any grades back. Fortunately, it's not that. God wants a relationship with each of us. And so how we can trust in Christ is just like a relationship. You ask someone to be your friend or you ask God to come into your life. So admit that you're a sinner. Recognize that only because Jesus died on the cross can we be saved from our sins. He took our punishment for us. And then ask Jesus to come into your life. Ask him to be your friend and Lord of your life and direct you. And trust me, you will not regret it. He knows the future. He knows your heart. How could we not trust him in leading us to the right places? So yeah, I'll pray us in that. If you feel like that's what God's calling you to do to make that decision, then pray this along with me. But dear father, dear father, thank you you for giving me this opportunity to be in a relationship with you for giving me this opportunity to be in a relationship with you. Thank you for coming to this earth and dying on the cross to save me from my sins. Thank you for coming to this earth and dying on the cross to save me from my sins. I know that I've done bad things and you know far better how many bad things I've done. I know that I've done bad things and you know far better how many bad things I've done. And thank you for still choosing to die for me despite knowing all those bad things. 
Thank you for still choosing to die for me despite doing those bad things. And so I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. So I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. And I ask that you would come into my life and help me to live as you've truly called me to live. And I ask that you would come into my life and you help me to live how you've truly called me to live. And Father, I pray that you would continue to transform my heart. And Father, I pray that you would continue to transform my heart. And help me as I stumble along this way. And help me as I stumble along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Woo-hoo. <laughs> Welcome yeah, to the family. You... Woo-hoo. New sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, uncles, aunts, and uncles. Yes. Uh, no more orphans. <laughs> amen. Yeah. The family of God, you're not an orphan anymore. Even if you, in the natural, you are. Amen. You're not. So contact us, okay? And let us know you prayed that. You rededicated or you prayed it for the very first time. And uh, we'll tell you what to do next. Okay. Yeah. And awesome. welcome to the next stage of your life. There's so much more out there. But also, if you have okay. questions, please reach out. Yes. When yeah. Jesus asked the disciples to follow him, you could imagine they had so many questions. <laughs> they kept asking a question after question. It wasn't until halfway through the Gospels and ha- more than halfway through Jesus's ministry that we see that they truly understood who Jesus was. So it's okay if you don't have all the answers. Yeah. I mean, I I just read yesterday, um, you know, where Jesus took the, okay. I always get this messed up. Is it two fish and five loaves or, you know, sometimes I I mix them up. Anyway, he fed 5,000 men plus women and children with these fish and loaves of bread. And then he goes away, um, you know, across and the disciples come looking for them for him. And he's like, you're only looking for me because I filled your belly. You're not looking for me because you know who I am. He just did this miraculous thing that there was tons of left, like 20 baskets of leftovers from the five loaves and two fish. So we don't know it all. They have, it took them a while to get it. After seeing that, it took them a while. So mm-hmm. you don't have to get it all at once. It's a, it's a lo- ongoing process. And it's what's fun about it, actually. Yeah. And there's a temptation to the first time Jesus revealed who he was to Peter Mm -hmm. by helping him catch all those fish. Peter looked up at Jesus and said, basically, leave me. I am a sinful person. Like, I do not deserve you. And for all of you who might be thinking that, like, I don't deserve God. I've done too much, too many bad things. Welcome to the party. (laughs) That is... (laughs) That is exactly what God specializes in and forgiving those who feel like they are unforgivable. And mm-hmm. he's just a good God. He's great at redeeming things that we thought were too messed up to be redeemable. It's true. He loved us before we loved him. He chose us before we chose him. You know, mm-hmm. nothing is unforgivable, unforgivable, you know, yeah. nothing that is. Um, so tell me, what do you feel God is saying right now to specifically writers? To writers. Mm-hmm. You don't know what the future holds. We don't know when the end times will come. We don't know what the end times will look like. Don't hold on to the U S I guess I could say that's a hard thing to say. And there's so much meaning behind that, but If God thinks his church and his mission will be furthered by the U.S. becoming a communist country or a dictatorship or just just being destroyed altogether, don't, don't let your whole life's ambitions rest on the fate of the U.S. Let it rest on God and what God is calling you to do. There is a big world out there and... I I feel like I'm not formulating this right in my mind, but let go of this life, I suppose. If you have dreams and ambitions, like I would love to go into the wilderness and just survive in the wilderness for months at a time. That would be so fun. I would absolutely love it. Like Into the Wild. I don't know if you've read that book or watched that movie 
Uh, but I would love to do that. But I just know in this lifetime, that's not going to happen. That'll happen in the next. But I can let go of that for these short 70, 80, maybe even 40, 30 years because God has a mission for me. I want to step into heaven knowing that I did all I possibly could to make God's name known and bring the last to him. So I hope that's your life ambition as well, too, for all of you listening. And I hope that together we can all start to let go of this material world that is so, so good at grabbing hold of us. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. I like that. Do I have a follow-up for that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, it's temporal. Our life is temporal. And we have to have that eternal perspective. And the things that, I mean, in your uh, in your book, you do talk about God allowing dreams to die. Mm-hmm. And um, so he allows some to die and then he resurrects them later in his time. And some were just not dreams from him that he had for you. And then there's others that you may not do it here on earth, but you'll certainly get to do it in heaven you know, cause he, mm-hmm. you know, he wants you to have the desires of your heart, but there's always a timing I- issue, you know, things like that. Yeah. And I think just to add on to that real quick, mm-hmm. we think we know what we want, That's but true. how many times have we thought we would love something? Like we'd love to go to Disneyland or something. And then we go and it's just a really big letdown or, mm-hmm. I mean, I've never been to Disneyland, so I don't know. But, you know, there's always those moments of like, once I get this thing, once I experience this thing, like, it'll be so awesome. And I'll love that thing. And then you get it and you're like, oh, no, that actually was not quite what I was hoping it would be. But then there's other things that you really do not think that you would like. And then you get forced into it anyways. And you walk away thinking, wow, that was really cool. I did not know I liked that so much. And God knows exactly how you're going to react to each thing. And he also has this special ability called the Holy Spirit, where even in the worst of situations, you can find tremendous joy. I've experienced that. I'm sure you've probably experienced it at some point, but God knows why, why I think that we are the only ones who know what we really like and God is wrong about us. <laughs> you know, that's, that's pride <laughs> right there. <laughs> he knows us very well. He knows the things we wish he didn't know about us and that we don't know about ourselves. And speaking of the Holy Spirit though, do you have like a Holy Spirit adventure story where he like pushed you or you, he sent you kicking and screaming into something and it ended up being the most amazing experience ever? You know, that's, that's a lot of my life. (laughs) Um, Going to the Middle East, honestly, was really scary. Um, I imagine. I don't know if I told you this or if I put it in this book, but I got my passport for the first time to move to the Middle East for nine months. So at the end of nine months, I started telling my friends, like, I can't wait to go to the U.S. And like, what are you talking about? You're from the U.S. I'm like, yeah, I'm from the U.S., but I've never gone to the U.S. I've only ever left it. So that was a pretty scary thing going the first time, though it was even scarier going the second time because I knew just how hard it could be. (laughs) Um, But each time, you know, I'm so glad that I went, you know, we let comfort control us in so many ways. And once we step outside our comfort zone, can we truly start to experience life and enjoy adventure you know comfort is like the number one enemy to adventure if you think about it (laughs) because every single adventure is going to be uncomfortable but if you have that adventure mindset then man it's it's you can look back on things and just love it (laughs) or even in the moment be like this is such an adventure and i am so cold (laughs) but this is so fun so just have an adventurous personality and mindset to it. But yeah, going to the Middle East was one of those things I never thought I would do. Uh, I thought I would just live my whole life in Denver, Colorado, but (laughs) here I am now having gone to 30 countries and it's like, who am I? Like, what in the world is this? But God knows, God knows. So trust him when he leads you to something because (laughs) he's very good at that. (laughs) 
Oh, definitely. Um, Sean Foyt, you probably have heard of him from, I can't remember the name of his ministry, the worship leader that travels around. And, you know, he went, he took his entire family, his wife and his little children to the Middle East. Um, I think it was Iraq. I'm not sure. Like a few months ago, but he grew up doing what you're doing now, going to Muslim countries, going all around the world as a missionary. And um, to me, it's like, wow, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, I have imagined it, but God just hasn't done it yet. And so when I go, you know, I'll know when it's the right time. But I, th I just think it's, um, you know, the pressure is what creates the beauty, like in a pearl. I love pearls. It's my favorite stone. But, you know, the pressure and, and uh, I can't think of the, you know, the movement <laughs> is what creates the beauty of a pearl. But um, anyway, that's amazing. Okay, so tell me, do you have any plans for any new books? Or just finish all the ones you have in process now? <laughs> Well, yeah. So I pretty much, we pretty much sing, finished the singleness book. And so that'll be, um, we're just going back through and editing it a little bit. The book that I am writing now is, uh, the book about the boy who's trapped on another planet. So that's, that's the plan for my next book. I have a sequel to that book and the other three sequels to my winter book. Um, in my mind, I've kind of created a sequel to my rifter book. So I'm never going to run out of ideas. I'm never going to be done writing. <laughs> um, but How much do you write a day? Do you write every day? Or, no, uh, I wish I could. I try to write at least once a week. And okay. then more often than that. But yeah, a lot of what I do is focused on evangelism and discipleship. So creating resources that are focused on evangelism and discipleship, blog posts, social media, doing evangelism and discipleship myself. Um, there's, there's a bunch of things that I do. And then now I have my drone, so I get to fly that and get some cool <laughs> drone videos, which. Yeah, that's going to be cool. Definitely follow me on Facebook or Instagram or go to my website, join my mailing list because um, there's going to be some really good stuff with that following up soon. I haven't posted much because I've just been getting some cool footage from all around. So anyways. Well, that, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be amazing. And you also have a podcast. I forgot to mention that. Tell us about your podcast. Yeah. So Living Wilder podcast is um, about basically interviewing missionaries and letting them share their adventures. <laughs> if, if you're starting to catch an idea of what I focus on, it's Jesus, following God and adventure <laughs> and most of them all together. And so, yeah, I've got some I don't, maybe you even heard of James R. Hannibal. I interviewed him. He's had some crazy adventures as well too, but uh, just sharing how God leads on crazy adventures and yeah, it might be scary. It might even be life-threatening, but I firmly believe that you're invincible until God's will for you is accomplished. <laughs> so I'm not afraid of going into hard places and um yeah, it's just giving them kind of a platform to share their really incredible God stories because I was really impacted by all those missionaries that I listed earlier, especially Brother Andrew's God Smuggler. And those yeah. stories are still happening to this day. You know, he might have smuggled Definitely. Bibles behind the Iron Curtain, but there's maybe the Iron Curtain's gone, but there's new countries that it's hard to smuggle Bibles into. I went on a secret missions trip into a uh, Asian country that we had to pretend like we were tourists and go on fake tourist trips while teaching pastors how to do evangelism and discipleship. So there's still adventure out there. That's for sure. Now, how can they um, learn how to do what you're doing? What was the name of the ministry you're involved in? So are you over the ministry? Are you part of the ministry or what? <laughs> uh, you give me too much credit. No, I'm part of the ministry. It's called the Great Commission Alliance. You can check us out, greatcommissionalliance.org. Uh, but as far as knowing how to do more of what I do, well, hopefully I would succeed in my life if I helped you find what God is calling you to do, not how to help you do what I do. So yeah, feel free to email me, message me. Um, you can find my contact info at philipwilder.com, one L and Philip. <laughs> and you can find me on social media, Philip Wilder author. Feel free to reach out. I 
I mean, it's literally my job <laughs> to help people find God's calling for their lives. So it would be an absolute joy to walk through that with you. Awesome. Well, you answered my last question was how can they find you? So um, do you have anything else that you want to mention to everyone? Live wilder. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds cheesy, but um, yeah. It, well, when you and, say well, it's not cheesy. When you say live wilder, what do you mean exactly? Wild is defined as not, not being tame, obviously. Well, so to live wilder would be to not be tamed by our society. Mm. Um, wild animals don't listen to anyone except for their the wildness within them, I guess. I'm not saying people just go around and do whatever they want, but we should be wild to the world and tame to God. <laughs> but oftentimes it's the opposite way around. So living wilder to me means living radically, I guess you could say, but following God, even if the it makes no sense to the world and ultimately coming back to adventure, God has some crazy adventures in store for us, but yeah. Or even through the church. Don't let the church system, which God's about to change that up, although I have no idea what it's going to look like, but don't let the church system tame you either. Cause that's, yeah. don't let religion like a religious spirit type of thing, tame you mm -hmm. and how God created you uniquely to be, you know, yeah. don't let, don't let that tame you. Cause there's a lot of people, you know, you go and you sit and you listen and you go home and that, that is not Christianity. That's not yeah. what Jesus died for, for you to go sit in a pew every Sunday. That's not yeah. what he died for. So don't let the church tame you either. <laughs> be who I, God created you to be. Right. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot fewer guys in church than women is because yeah. we've kind of changed church into a self-help sort yes. of organization and left out the mission. And mm -hmm. guys love missions. Guys love tasks. Guys love wars to fight. And and girls do too, but oh, yeah. I think it really speaks to guys' hearts. And so we need to bring that back. That is what, I mean, look at the lives of the disciples <laughs> you cannot say that they were not fighting a war or that they were not living adventure like i mean just listening to paul list off all the trials that he faced like i faced hunger at sea adrift <laughs> i faced hunger in prison i faced hunger traveling whatever anyways he he's gone through craziness but yeah no i totally agree with you um we're in a war right now all around the world the enemy has tried to shut down the churches. Everything that happened, I believe, is about the church because, well, the church was asleep and we allowed it all. To, we let the comfort come in that you talked about, Philip. We let the comfort come in. And that's not, again, that's not what Jesus died for. I mean, being comfortable is great, but that's not what it's about. Um, so we're in a war. And uh, so now stand up, do what he tells you to do, speak out where he says to, um, you know, pray for the persecuted church, but now we have the persecuted church all over the world, not just in some small countries. We have them in Canada and Australia. And of course we know China and then all the small countries too. So do whatever God is telling you to do and uh, band together, band together believers and, and God will give you the word. He'll give you the wildness. He'll give you the spirit of Elijah to create a thing. It'll, it'll happen. It'll change things. And, um, so it's amazing. God is on the move. It's an exciting year. <laughs> it's an exciting year. It's an exciting year. <laughs> what an adventure. Life. Here it is. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, thank you, Philip. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bill, the bell. <laughs> and on the podcast, like, subscribe, and rate the podcast unless you hate it. Don't rate it. Okay. But if you like it, subscribe. And uh, so you can get a hold of Philip, philipwilder.com with one L, uh, greatcommissionalliance.org for information that way. If you prayed with us earlier, please contact him or me. And so we can help you go, um, you know, maybe uh, if you, if you contact me, I'll get you a Bible. And so we'll help you get started in your faith and uh, 
help you get going. And he has a lot of resources that I don't have with a great commission. So definitely contact him. So we love you guys. And thank you for listening. Thank you for watching and keep writing. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to like and subscribe and rate the podcast unless you hate it. Also, for group coaching one-on-one and speaking events, contact me on writeintohighcalling.com and sign up for the email list. All right, until next time, keep writing. Thank you.